Jeff Buckley, Phil Dre, Tim Sternberg, and my brother Timothy Hill. You know, this is a long, long show this evening. Four and a half hours of live radio, and we're a little bit through it. We have a lot of people uh, ahead in the next, in the remaining uh, long period of time. I won't be specific because if I be too specific, you'll all go home now. No, no way. We'll all stay. It's frightening. Ken, Ken, Ken I want to introduce you personally to a, a friend of mine, another fellow Oregonian, a, a, a one Mr. Matthew Courtney. Ladies Matthew. and gentlemen, Matthew Courtney. My pleasure, Matthew. Matthew Courtney, uh, some of you may know, presumably, I suppose. If you're familiar with words in New York City, you may be familiar with Matthew Courtney. And he's going to accompany you all in Radio Land and here at Fez. We're broadcasting live from Fez. For those of you who don't know where we are, if you just tuned in, please be advised. We're located on the corner of Lafayette and Great Jones in Manhattan. Grace you're welcome Jones. to come down. Grace, yeah, Lafayette and Grace Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Courtney is going to help us out here for the next uh, little while. And coming back in about an hour and a half uh, or so, the angel-headed hipsters will be back with us. But right now they're going to go have a couple of drinks, go have a little dinner. I think that's a real nice thing to do. <laughs> and as for me, Mr. Babs, I'll turn the whole thing over to you. And uh, if you need any help with anything, I'll be here to give you a hand. Cause don't, I... don't turn the whole thing over to him. That would be really depressing because these people got to have something to do too. Well, that's true. That's true. We are all in this together. You know, one of the rules of the acid test when we did the acid test back in the 60s was it had to go all night. If you interrupted it, it was like Coetus interrupt us and everybody went around real fidgety afterwards. But if you went all the way to the end in the morning and everybody went out when the sun came out, we had a sense of satisfaction and finality and everybody spread that out through the land. I can hang with that. All right. Probably by a rope, but I can hang with that. Okay, well, I hung by that rope too. All right, so okay. when in the Beaver State, uh, look uh, Mr. Babs up. Thank you. And uh, when I'm visiting the Beaver State, I'll look up the, the beavers that are left there and look you up. All right, thank you. <laughs> Let's just get started. I thought that... Um, I thought if I didn't have anything to do today, I'd start growing some hair or maybe raise a family or maybe just go through the motions of either or, right? But I decided I'd come down here, and I figured it's so freezy now, I figured everybody would be wa uh, listening to this show on the radios at home. I guess no one listens to the radio anymore, and um, or everybody's just um, getting loaded and cruising. Can I say that? This, do, Lutheran, do Lutherans say that? Okay, because I know it's a Lutheran college. Um, anyway... It's like that old joke, uh, the, why don't, uh, uh, ba what is it, why don't uh, Baptist, what? Why don't Baptists have sex standing up because it can lead to dancing? No, I don't know. Any, any Baptists in the, no. No, Christians are great. It's always open, seasons on, open season on wasps. It's always okay. It's okay. Um, love a bunch of wasps. Um, it's true. My name is Matthew Courtney. That's with two T's. And I'm very much on this mission to, to, um, to uh, demystify poetry. It's a very exciting thing. Poetry's everywhere. Just open your eyes and get a grip. Excuse me for interrupting, Matthew, yeah. but for those of us who aren't in the know, give us a little background. You know, what, what's your gig? Are you a famous guy here in New York on the radio or something? No, I'm not. I'm not really famous. I, uh, I'm... Ah, I'm, oh, no, no. I mean, everybody oh, knows you. Just, <laughs> No, I mean, you know, we, 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 you must agree, Mr. B, that most artists, when, when the group together, are a pretty insufferable bunch to be around. <laughs> I mean, no, most artists think that, you know, the, the feces has no aroma, or right. you know what I'm trying That's to say. Right. Yeah, skunk you know. smells his own hole first. Yeah, and, you know, we're trying to, I'm just trying to liberate the species, and I know it's a tall order, <laughs> but I'm just, through poetry, liberate the species. Oh, I get you. Okay, thank you. And that get is, a few dates. That's for <laughs> so, my edification. Thank you very thank much. You. No, I, <laughs> thank you. I think we probably should move on. I feel like I could talk and wax. Do I, can I just wax all day? <laughs> no. It is my birthday, and what's his face is tomorrow. Happy birthday Thank you very to much. you. Please. Happy no. birthday to you. Thank you. You're beautiful. You're collectively Happy beautiful. Birthday, no, you're collectively dear beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Happy Thank you. birthday. It's to a good thing an Aquarius you. is running this show now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're, every one of you knows what it means to be a man or, and or woman, slash. I think, what, that's funny? 
It's funny about gays in the military. I think we should let gays openly be in the military. Let's think about it. I know a lot of wonderful heterosexuals that are, have always moved in on uh, gay jobs. I mean, think of all those uh, life beautifying jobs like, like cooks, uh, interior designers, actors, singers. There's some great hetero, there's a few heterosexuals that know how to do those jobs. You know, like chefs and, and, and painters and artists. I say, let, let, you know, let, a few, let a few queers, you know, learn how to kill and occupy your town. What do you say? I don't know. <laughs> I feel I can, can I say queer? Yes! A few Lutheran queers. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that, I know. So let's just, let's just get a grip and stop looking at me like that. I'll be off soon enough. I know the glare factor must be, must be uh, aforementioned liberating. <laughs> Tim, but... You should have heard the guys up earlier. There's nothing you can do wrong, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think he knows, yeah, and he knows what it means. So should I go ahead and introduce the next former? Because I feel like I can, I'm still so comfortable. I feel like I was born with a mic inside my mouth world. Well, I, well, we'll wait. I got because I'm going to be up here for a bit. Um, I had a dream last night that I turned my head into a restaurant and, and served my friends exotic brain dishes. When you have a dream like that, you know, eat, you know, pizza. So um, let me introduce our, our first performer. Of this set is um, is the author of ten books. Uh, titled variously one, two, three, and four, five, but works in prisons and schools and is a City Lights author. Would you welcome Janine Palmi Vega? Hey, hey, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. Hey, spot. You're listening to WFMU Uppsala College, East Orange, New Jersey. By way of identification, here at the top of the hour. Right, and when we have these little quiet moments, just take the time to get to know your neighbor, and there's lots of lap space. <laughs> mm. Okay. I've known. Is Peter still here? Is Peter still here? Yeah, Peter's in the house. Well, anyway, I've known them for a long time, Alan and Peter, and I have to say that. Um, in the 50s and the 60s, the women didn't only be the muse, and the women didn't only wash the shirts. Right. You know Diane De Prima. She didn't wash shirts. I got uh, three pieces. I work in the prison, and um, the prisons of New York State. So I see a lot of people inside and I see them when they come back again and again and again. And this poem is about that. It's called Mushroom. It's dedicated to everybody I've ever worked with. Hundreds of people, women, men, children, in the system that we're all part of here. When I woke up this morning, I saw it clearly. Cancer pressing in at the windows of all the jails and prisons of America. Growing on the bars of all the jails and prisons of America. Waiting in a pool at the exit to attach itself to your feet just as you leave. Fighting heroically in iron forests, we write poems gather together we light little candles and congratulate ourselves on small successes another voice in the chorus another consciousness in the web and fabric of us clandestinely fighting back and then you leave Outside the forest of iron trees and visible campfire, you hit the street. And the same conditions that ever propelled you to rebellion, anger, self-destruction, slam you in the face. Mushroom has already caught onto the lip of your soul, pretending to be a shadow. 
And like a pale, fat man with dainty fingers Start delicately to eat Mushroom has already caught on to the lip of your soul Pretending to be a shadow Like a pale, fat man with dainty fingers Start delicately to eat You say, no, I didn't get high tonight. Hey, your money's safe with me. Tomorrow, I'm going down to welfare. Monday, I might start a new job. Tell me why, and I'm not driving. Let me five bucks. And all the shadows we fought together. All the shadows. Huddled around the light, together Naming and condemning the enemy All the shadows we extirpate with song Rise up They take up lodgings again In you and me It's no big secret We carry the seeds around In the soles of our feet All the shadows we extirpate with song rise up. They rise up. They take up lodgings again. You in me is no big secret. It's no big secret. We carry the seeds around in the soles of our feet. Janine Tommy Vega. This is a short poem without music. And it's built around the idea of going into schools. And the thing about it is I go into a lot of New York State schools and there are a lot of born again Christians. I guess you know that. So I went into one right down the street from Greenhaven Prison as it turns out. And they said that I shouldn't come in, that I couldn't teach their kids because I was channeling the intuition of children down to states of witchcraft, hell, and the devil. Oh, straight business. Straight business. And the thing is, it's one thing to read about it, and it's another thing to be branded as a witch and stand up there and see 40 pairs of eyes totally afraid. So this is an answer to that. It's called witchcraft. Wish you hadn't have said that about channeling the intuition inside kids as though I were drilling down into their ears. Wish you hadn't mistaken intuitive power for the devil. I saw a devil once. He was a closed face, like a fist, a concrete wall thrown up against understanding. The bodhisattvas say, until everyone's free, no one is free. Heap the wood up for the next fire and I'll dance around it like the checks on May Day. Call it Charles's Castle or Charlie Stone. Either way, I'll be there with the fire roaring, pyramid shaped, and watch its mirror image in my heart. Fire burns and doesn't burn. Where's my broomstick? Trust me. Janine Palmy Vega. There's Janine Palmy Vega. Okay. Do one more. And, uh, well, we got, she wants to be, okay. Okay, this piece is called. Oops, sorry. I'm just the middleman, just the middleman. This piece is called Earl the Pearl. It's for a blues singer who uh, was in the Seventh Sun. And the thing about him was he came down to do a benefit. Grizzly night, rain, ice. And he said, uh, as he was tuning his guitar, he said, well, you know, you can be a king or a beggar, but when you're dead, you're dead. You can be a loved one. You can be alone. When you're dead, you're dead. Went on like that. Then he did a couple of tunes. 
and he stood up and he walked outside Earl the Pearl and he died. So this here is for Earl the Pearl. Crossing the river on the far side is a sphere of light. If a sphere of light has a face, it is your face with a sweet expression. I salute your spirit from a small enclosed space. I salute the directions through which you travel. You have not yet arrived. Your spirit is waiting for you to catch up, to come in. What great deed did you do that you could leave your body doing what you loved, sharing what you knew in the sweet common denominator of the blues? When you're dead, you're dead, you said. And for those of us standing in the hallway, true enough. But walking across the flat stones of the river, you see there is no such thing. And your spirit, like a sphere, is waiting for you to catch up, to come in, to find your way home. Happy birthday, Earl the Pearl. Happy death day, Earl of Pearl. What great deed did you do to earn such a fine leave taking? We said, let's have a parade, but there already is one. Hallelujah, choruses high stepping one side of the bridge to the other. Hallelujah, choruses high stepping one side of the river to the other and a sphere that has your face is smiling happy birthday Earl of Pearl happy death day Earl of Pearl happy birthday Earl of Pearl you shared it all That was Janine Palmy Vega. And let's keep in mind uh, where... Uh, More women. Well, let's keep in mind who we are and who we aren't. Because, uh, All right. Let's keep in mind who our band is. Hooge Voodoo is Dennis Kelly, Bruce Grant, and Harley Fine. They're the... Uh, you can imagine your entire life with a musical background, just going down the avenue with music in your step. Imagine what your life would be like and where you would walk and where you wouldn't walk. Actually, you'd walk everywhere. All right, everybody, um, let's, um, performers, we got a big show tonight. Let's everybody keep it short so everybody can go on because we don't want the poets who went on a long time to lose any sleep tonight because they made other people not get on the stage. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. Um, uh, Mr. Hell was very short and sweet. Who's our next performer is, um, is Jennifer Blowdryer. Uh, Jennifer Blowdryer, Mr. and Mrs. Blowdryer's baby girl from the very illustrious Blowdryer's of Boston family. And um, she knows what it means to be a woman, a performer, a human being. She knows what poetry is. And she's not afraid to, uh, you know, squeeze a few off in front of you. So please welcome, squeeze a few off. Please welcome Jennifer Blowdryer. I wasn't going to sing, but I have a, uh, I'm going to think I'm going to do the beginning of a song where I steal a, a Diane DiPrima line. You cried once, you cried twice, like the poet said, get your cutthroat off my knife. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, I should do something really short, I guess. Should I do something mean or something travelly? Travelly? Uh -huh. Travelly. Uh -huh. Okay. Can you not swear? That went out the window with. Went up out the window with radio. No, no. Uh, Liza was a screwed up girl from the suburbs. Somewhere along the line, she had picked up a kind of Woolworths mysticism, tarot cards, reincarnation, and a vague ambition to paint. Daddy paid to put her in an art school, a babysitter for screwed up rich kids like herself. And as she labored to keep up with her one painting a year deadline, Liza was happy for a while. Liza, you see, was not an attractive, screwed up rich girl. She did not have the whimsical charm of a Patty Hearst. Her huge legs and acne scarred face pointed her out as a peasant of some other society. Evolution had no way of knowing that an entire line of human beings would go from functioning at manual labor to uselessly examining their dull problems in as little as one generation. Cults began to take an interest. Liza was starting to look more and more like a large, ugly bank account walking around. Some people, cults know, will never get completely cut off. The parent with the money feels guilty about what a mess they made and their unparental but natural desire to simply keep the mess as far away as possible rather than inviting it in to stay. And the phone calls started to pour in humanists, language instructors, left-wing political groups, and psychic healers. Liza signed virtually everything on the street she could find in her painful restlessness. The solicitors looked at her hound dog eyes and put three stars next to her name as her bulky figure ambled away. Liza was careful, though. She selected the best one. Self-actualization had the added plus of psychic, mystical knowledge and personal attention. The canny recruiter, a beatnik poetess gone to seed, rented out a rundown cabin in the country for the weekend and charged each screwed up rich kid a few hundred dollars to share her company. Um, I'll read a couple more paragraphs and then I'll get off because this is kind of a long, a long story that gets meaner. And The purpose was to bring something old and travel back in time with it. She found a fork that looked old and brought it to her expensive weekend hideaway. She had a momentary cow-like grin of contentment when the weekend was over. You won't believe what this fork has been through, she made sure to tell everybody. The drifters in her apartment looked up from her drug supply long enough to share anecdotes of their own intense experience with the mysterious occult world, and then looked over at her television set. Liza scheduled more and more getaways. Gradually, self-actualization joined all the other broken toys in her closet. The novelty of her own spiritual advisor wore thin, and the failed bohemian poetess started thinking that an office job might be more pleasant after all. And soon Liza was back to her restless, violent self. There wasn't even the usual few seconds of contentment when she returned from her trips, and Liza got an idea. Didn't her very incompetence make her sort of an outcast? Maybe even a street person? Couldn't she be some kind of gang leader, an aggressive entrepreneur? She started to deal drugs, or she tried, getting the mental institution escapee to bake acid into animal crackers, thereby accidentally erasing the potency of the drug. She bought huge quantities of mediocre marijuana that somehow filtered right through her smelly, parasitic household without a penny coming in. But some people just don't get cut off ever, and in that respect, our heroine continued to be lucky. She shaved her mousy brown hair into a mohawk and managed to dye it a kind of sickly orange, making her ugliness more pointed, both more and less grotesque. And that's it. Thanks. That was Jennifer Blowdryer, who uh, writes for the New York Press. 
She recently went to Holland on a spoken word tour, and her most famous work is her resume. No, it is, I've heard this resume many times, and it's really, you know, you hang on, man. And uh, the thing is, is that everybody, we're going to start doing, if, you, if any poet goes over five minutes, I'm going to slam on the piano keys. And please, audience, let's have some, let's have some fun. Let's have some fun with just a little verbal abuse tonight. Con some constructive heckling, and I don't mean interrupting performers, but from now on, if performers go over five minutes, feel free rebar, to... Rebar, rebar. No, seriously, as loud as you can. On, on my beat, on my beat, you can do this, okay? <laughs> what do I care? It's my birthday. So, uh, what do we want? Uh, what do you want to say? No, you can't have one minute. For God's sake, there's many people ahead of you. I'm just as egalitarian as the next guy, but not that egalitarian. Oh, yeah, Mr. Corso has the flu tonight, and he is at home. So, I think... And he's going to be passing around a Hallmark card for all of you to sign. No, I'm just kidding. That's not nice. I'm sure Mr. I've never met Mr. Corso, but I have had the flu. And, and um, okay. Now our next performer uh, hangs out at uh, Katz's Deli a lot. No, wait. It's, no, I'm sorry. It's Vincent Katz. I'm sorry. That's Jimmy Carter who hangs out there a lot. I had to do it. I've always wanted to do it. Um, he's the author of New York Hello. He's written a new play that will be produced this spring at La Mama. Welcome, Vincent Katz. Hello. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Cassidy's book, The First Third. Before that, though, I was kind of thinking about Cassidy, and it seems to me that he's uh, more of a philosopher than anything else, in his, both in his actions and uh, in his interest in perception. So. I found this little thing on the uh, Greek philosopher Diogenes that I like to read. This is about Diogenes, but kind of applies to Cassidy as well. His main principles were the following. Happiness is attained by satisfying only one's natural needs and by satisfying them in the cheapest and easiest way. What is natural cannot be dishonorable or indecent and therefore can and should be done in public. Conventions which are contrary to these principles are unnatural and should not be observed. From this there results in practical life self-sufficiency, self -sufficiency, supported by training the body to have as few needs as possible, and shamelessness. Mainly on account of the latter quality, Diogenes was called Keon, dog, from which appellation the name of the cynics is derived. Uh, the section I'm going to read it takes place in 1933. Cassidy was seven years old, and his brother Jim that he refers to was 12. My new home had been quite an improvement over the Metropolitan, having a large room that was used for everything except whatever activity could be crowded into a small kitchenette, and where, beneath long glass-doored cupboards, on one much-marred wall of this low-ceilinged, carpeted, high wainscoted living room, there was an oblong wood panel centered with a handle which was pulled out to bring out on its always sticking rollers a large bed we all used for sleeping, except corner palleted Jimmy or any tipsy overnight visitors. Unwillingly, I often used it in another way, for here it was that Jimmy would imprison me with typical care to restrain any show of sadistic delight, knowing well that a revealing chuckle or two might betray his evil to mother. When he shoved it, the bed went inside the wall horizontally, and my clearance was less than a foot. So, besides fear of this lack of room to rise up as I lay breathing ever so slowly in the total darkness, there were strong twin terrors of realization. One, that I couldn't scream for release or Jim would surely beat me, and two, that any yelling would also unnecessarily hasten to extinguish the all too small supply of oxygen. These claustrophobic experiences caused another reaction even more unusual and less easy to explain. A reeling of my senses caused, I imagined, by an off-balanced wheel whirling around with close clearance inside my skull, which, while slowly increasing in tempo, set up a loose fan-like vibration as it rotated into ever-tightening flutter. 
More exactly, it was simply an awareness that time in my head had gradually apexed to about triple its ordinary speed of passage. And as this thing happened, although I couldn't realize it then, it was just thought of as a circular flying object twirling through my mind for lack of a better way to think about this spinning sensation. But actually it was felt, nervously, only for what it was, a strange, pleasant quickening of my brain's action, which was disturbing enough to frighten, yet resisted any rigorous attempt to throw it off and return to normal headedness. This time acceleration came and went of its own accord, making me thus dizzy-minded, although only while inside my mattressed jail, and then not every time, all through this first Snowden year. It was nearly a full score years later before I again had similar head spins from different stimuli such as marijuana, but which this time I tried to hold and analyze. And I found by heavy concentration I could, for short moments, turn this time quickening off and on at will once it had started. But the prime requisite to hold still as death and listen intently for the inner ear to speed up its buzz until, with regular lever-like flips, my mind's gears Speed. were shifted by unknown mechanisms Speed. to an increase of time's torrent that received in kaleidoscopic change searing images, clear Speed as the up. hurry of thought could make them, rushing so quickly by that all I could do was barely Speeding catch the imagery time. of one that before another crowded was much too difficult to continue for very long. Since any speed. outside distractions, Speed such as up. noise, would disrupt the process of maintaining absolute body inertia. And I failed to match these mental eruptions firmly enough to any reasonable come. explanations in reality, so that the cause, cure, or real workings of these Be singularly rebar. fresh and concise visions were forever beyond my diagnosis, in fact, beyond my remembering, except as residue. Almost every flashing scene, once it had spun by, it's always like that. Yeah. <clears throat> that was Vincent Katz. And, uh, remember, everybody's got a poem, poem in them. Don't let anybody tell you different. Get up and read the phone book, find something on the ground, do found poetry, make it up, there's jazz. Just like art is beyond criticism. You may not know much about art, but I know you know what's suitable for framing. Because <laughs> I, I have a feeling you know these this much. Why Americans spend thousands of dollars on TV, stereos, and furniture, but they'll frame a $6.95 print. Because that's who we are. We're Americans. Let's go with that crazy culture. So we all got a poem in it. So don't let the poetry mafia scare you, because they are around. And they all, I don't know if they know who they are, but you probably all do. But without poets, it's just the mirror on the wall. You know, no, without, no, without the audience, you're just a mirror on the wall. And we have to forget what a wonderful luxury this is to, to liberate you with our poetry. <laughs> and I believe that. I believe that. Because without you, we're, we're fluffing. We're fluffy. Without you, we're stuffing. I, it's raining. It's pouring. My love life smells of Herman Goring. No, why? Let's, there's always room for shtick. Everything's poetry. Don't let anybody tell you different. Oh, we'll move on. Um, our next performer is the author of 247365. He is also the originator of Headline Rhymes. Please welcome Reggie Gaines. Testing, 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 testing. Ladies and gentlemen, huge voodoo. Give them a hand, please. To Arthur Ashe. Arthur, I know it was a struggle. You're free, man. Rest in peace. I'd like to kick a poem for two women um, who have put a new meaning in making getting more for less. Uh, I want to kick this poem out to Zoe Baird <laughs> and Miss Wood. And uh, don't feel bad, girls. A lot of people did the same thing. They just didn't get caught. This is called Jamaica to Roslyn. Next stop, Roslyn, cried the gray balding man, collecting overpriced tickets for the short, uncomfortable ride. 20 women speaking in dialect strange, but somehow familiar. Traveling from places with names like Brownsville, Bed-Stuy, Harlem, the Bronx. But most have come from Jamaica. They search for the land of milk and honey, yet isn't it funny? 
how the wages they're paid hardly make them able to put milk on their own dinner table. Creates an atmosphere of joy which envelops the walls of the Dre Steel Cab, whose destination is the New South. As they leave the train, bidding one another fond farewells, the Range Rover Patrol jockeys for a position with the Mercedes Benz Brigade as the pungent aroma of freshly baked onion bagels fill the air. Rear doors fling open, and the modern day slaves rush to find their masters. Salon tanned women operating large dark sedans where fudge brown faces sit pompously in plush leather seats enjoying the view where they slowly chew on warm pieces of bread while up ahead lies the estate. Regal palaces of queens and kings marble gleaming, hot tub steaming, a silent somber peace they've arrived in the land of Nouveau Riche where shiny satin tennis outfits are the uniform of the day and shrill voiced women are proud how little they pay the new slave who cook, clean, iron, sew, and know they're exploited and do nothing but grin and bear it or be turned into immigration which will scare the hell out of you if you're Haitian, Jamaican, or just black and poor. So they fall to the floor, crusty knees becoming more and more sore scrubbing areas large as tennis courts which serenely sit next to elaborately constructed swimming pools they thankfully do not have to clean. And though the work is hard, you can always hear the faint hum of a Bob Marley tune amidst the rancid odor of scalding water and ammonia rising from plastic buckets into brown broad nostrils causing silent tears to flow. But for the modern day slave, no one grieves as the cool spring air rustles round money-colored leaves which sprout from what seems like a million trees surrounding the estate and I wonder if the new slaves hate their masters and their work is done as the setting sun signals the end of another day hey here's your pay hurry don't delay got to get you to the station right away or I'll miss my appointment with a plastic surgeon As they climb aboard the drab metal cab, smiling, deep inside they cry. And false tales of preferential treatment swirl through the cab like day old trash in a violent winter wind. As the gray balding man screams out to the sea of dark, wretched souls. Next stop, Jamaica. Testify, testify. All right. <clears throat> that was Reg E. Gaines. And, um, okay. Reggie. Now, I was saying earlier we all got a poem in us. A poem in us. That doesn't mean that anybody wants to hear it or, or anybody will give you a gig. But listen, that's what stamps and postcards and pencils are for. Everybody's got a poem in them. So, you know, don't let anybody fool you. Uh, everybody's got something to say. Like I said, we doesn't mean we'll frame it or buy it or love it. But it's like fingerprints. We all got them and, you know, all parts of us stink and smell good. So let's just unify on that and start from there. Foundation. Okay. Our next performer is the reigning champ of the Improv Slam at the New Eurekan. She's a jazz poet from Poughkeepsie. Please welcome Bahia Watson. Oh, 
color. I see now the gesture of his cheekbone collapsing in a rush bus on God. How he said it were. Gray slabs of sidewalk. How much he is a touch of sleepers. How did his snow in feet to a J-O-B sweating late in the winter and never was so vain as to talk about slave wages. Out of respect, he said, for the ease of his flight next to their middle passage. Gray Billy, his baby was a grim death of the mind, impaled on a thousand points of overly light lies. And because poor people don't understand to know God, they pay the way of their green money right over the grave. And he would not cry for his child. The way he said it were his child was inside sky, as he knew it to be. Gray man Billy, my boy on the beat down concrete street he never could get out of, where the next rain will wash away the stain of his only grave marker. Where blue beat him on a typical whim, not knowing he slow, holding his soul back, only push him further to his idea of heaven and how Billy how there should be something more to give you Billy than a poem how I want to find you justice of course want to peace and even guilty on a reasonable doubt get to quit it something more to give you Billy than words and promises of what we will and shall but have yet to do 30 years past this Good morning to Watson Riot 2. And I will remember Billy, your burn to a beat that your newfound freedom, Billy Gray, who found that the only way a slave ever can. I will remember Billy, your eyes riding on newfound peace in the burn to beat that dead man, my man. Dead man, my man, dead man, my man, dead man, my man, Billy man, Billy man, Billy man, Billy man, Billy. Billy, 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 Billy. Sounds like that was Bahia Watson, also known as a Apocalypse Weaned in Poughkeeps. Okay. Let's make it for me here. Okay. I'm wild again, beguiled again. What, I just had my bathroom retiled again? What, I don't know. See what you can write when you're in love? Don't get me started. No, okay. Please, uh, I just want to let you know a couple people who are coming up. So I know there's a lot of craziness and tension tonight with who's following who. But uh, after the next performer I introduce will be uh, Maggie X, Steph, Seth King, David Hoverman, Edwin Torres, uh, Matthew Benedict, Bob Holman, Pedro Pietri. So just so you know. Um, uh, but let me introduce our next performer. She's a rancher and a longtime hot spot in this spoken word scene. And uh, that would be uh, Sara Litsky. In the 60s, uh, we women, we took off our bras because we wanted to hang with each other. I want to hang with the women, with the men, the animal, the vegetable, the pineapple. I don't care. I want us to all hang, 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 hang. Hang. For, for, for Neil Cassidy. For Neil. The Buddha's hangnail blues. When I can feel loneliness dancing up and down my spine with heavy artillery on, I'm gone. I got the Buddha's hangnail blues. When even the silver wingo bingo of pure poetry cannot turn me on, 
I, I'm gone. I got the Buddha's hangnail blues. I got a diet Pepsi out of a soda machine. 99% air and 1% cocaine dream. Thank you. Flashed on a tiny screen and a tinny little mechanical voice said, Thank you. I got the prosthetic breast, synthetic womb, plastic utopian, lost, lost utopian news. I went out searching for something real, slipped on a manana peel and fell right down through the hole in the bottom of Shiva's soul. I got those Buddha's hangnail blues. 25 years after Martin Luther King died, racism is sanctified, money is deified, gluttony is glorified, the revolution has calcified. What do we got? What do we got? We got the Buddha's hangnail blues. I am a lost Brooklyn cowgirl, a too late be here now, girl. I spend my afternoons in coffee shops waiting for phony tantra jocks. It's the Buddha's hangnail blue. Oh, baby, you got oh, 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 I got it. You're right, I got it. I paid my amphetamine, methadine, dexedrine, psilocybin dues. That's why my brain is covered with screws, with screws, with screws. The toilet seat is covered with glue. No one will come to my rescue. I got the Buddha's hangnail blues. All the gone hip cats are strung out like pub caps in the darkened parking lots across America. I got them. I got the Janice Joplin, yeah. Abby Hoffman, yeah. Buddha's hangnail blues. down my nail. Um, hey, say, Matthew, if I can interrupt just for a second here. I don't see why not. You got me on the spot. Okay, but uh, we want to let all these poets here tonight that want to read that after the, we're done with the regular, we're going to keep going as long as we can and let everybody read. That's the thing. Yeah. Talk that's... to Eileen back there. And let's... Set up the schedule. Right, and let's talk about the fact that we're in Russia. You know, there'd be no small feat to have a 2,000 uh, seed poetry reading. Russia was having poetry readings like crazy, you know, just everywhere, everything. So it, this is really a beautiful thing to come here and hear spoken word. I mean, it's really, I think it is. I mean, without the audience, which is an incredible crowd tonight, it's really testifies that you want to hear some words. And, you know, Sunday is such a great TV night, you know, and sun, uh, at least I, you know, read about it a lot. But uh, it's cold out, and uh, no, obviously no one listens to the radio anymore, but the Lutherans and a lot of students. But I think um, really... Uh, this is wonderful to testify. That was Sarah Litsky. What I'm trying to say is this kind of event is very special. Because, you know, I don't see why not. Our next performer is the lead singer of I Love Everybody. She is the sex goddess of the Western Hemisphere. It's all order. And that's Maggie Estep. Hi. No, 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 no. I'm not a normal girl. I'm an angry, sweaty girl, so not normal flesh, because I really want you to. Want you to. I'm not a normal girl. I like to bathe myself in hamburger meat, then feed it to the not normal boys I meet. Make them lick it from between my toes, one slimy particle at a time, because I am not a normal girl. 
I'm too full of contradictions and kinks and the weirdest things make my panties sweat. And I've got to tell you, it's very important to make my panties sweat. In fact, sometimes I think about how if I were ever to run for political office, panty sweat would be the theme of my campaign. I want men, women, and dogs, too, to wear huge, droopy panties with disgusting stains on them. Mustard, mustard-colored stains. It'll be equality through panty stains. It'll be a revolution, a brand new twist on evolution, yeah! I'll fix up the economy, create jillions of jobs in the panty stain removal industry. Retired bondage queens in spiky boots walking the creases out of people stained with slime panties. And all the not normal boys who lick particles of hamburger meat from between my toes until their tongues go raw. They'll form an uncorrupt union of toe lickers, a model organization for the working class, an unopiated ideal for the masses, yeah! And all of America will be chanting, thank you, not normal girl, thank you, not normal girl, because it'll be a brave new world. No more Thorazine, no more methadone, no electric chairs, no simulated stair machines with bulimic and bloated would-be beauty queens ascending ever upwards to a prefab ideal of feminine perfection. No cities, all territories will spread out like a huge, all territories will spread out like a huge droopy panty on which the elastic has gone dead. Panty economics is what it'll be. And the not normal panty president is who I will be because I am not a normal girl. I don't think I'm ever gonna be a normal girl, but still, all the same, I'm terribly popular. That was Maggie Estep. Yeah. Poop on. Poop on. Poop on wheat. Wait, poop on grape poop on? Poop on. Poop on wheat, you eat it. She's talking about mustard and things. Couldn't help thinking it at the piano. Our next performer, let me just tell you, the vodka chocolate reading series will be happening here every Tuesday. Uh, the next one is um, uh, February 9th with Kimberly Flynn, Heather, Heather Woodbury, David Hoverman and the Scum Wrenches, and shows to be followed Tuesday the 16th with David Trinidad, Linda Jablonski, Jennifer Blowdryer, Lynn Tillman on the 23rd, Kevin Duffy, Willie Padarmo, and Matthew Courtney and Gary Indiana. Who's Matthew Courtney? This bald fuck. Hi, Matthew. Uh, Woodchuck, uh, Woodchuck, Wood, if you talk to him nice, he's a great guy. Covered with fur, love him. <laughs> Uh, and this series is uh, curated by Wanda uh, Phipps and Christian Hunter. They curated it. They're curators with a heart of gold. Just ask them. They'll tell you they got one. No, I'm just kidding. Lovely little joke. Okay, um, let's go. Let me introduce our next performer. He's the editor of the audio magazine Sheep on a Bus. Please welcome Seth King. All right, Seth. Yeah. Give it to him. To my left, uh, you'll have to excuse my voice or what there is of it. I'm kind of on the shallow end of a flu. Uh, to my left is Mike D'Elia. He's going to be playing the Mbira or African thumb piano. The young man's face was a dented car as it appeared blindly around the curve of the bar. His smile was a wicked wreck. The woman wore the name of a flower. Though not born in the concrete, she'd taken root there. She smiled at him. He said his name. It was a violent name, like his face. Like a baseball bat can be violent or a bust. She touched his arm. She'd found him. 
She'd never been beautiful, but she had a kind of sparkle on her lips. Her eyes, she was either drunk or insane. The boy with the wicked dented face always smiled. He smiled until it was meaningless. He still had his teeth. He wasn't a handsome in his smile. She thought he shouldn't smile so much. He told a joke, a stupid joke, but she laughed. Her petals strewn across the bar. She bought him a whiskey and a beer and some room at a table in the corner. Her hand rarely left his thigh when she found it. He kept both his hands on the table, folded like a prayer over his beer. He kept the smile of his youth always within easy reach. She talked to him. She bought him another round. He hoped he could get it up. He tried to imagine her body. He tried to imagine his desire. The apartment was so heavily clothed that the starkness of her body appalled him. Her walls covered in carpets and bits of cloth exuded a kind of softness and warmth. It was the antithesis of what lay before him, strewn, no, scattered across the bed, a pale popsicle, a yawning white rubber tube. When the woman left off trying to masturbate the boy and began to masturbate herself, the boy felt desire rise in him welcome and inevitable as vomit. He ground his teeth to taste his own blood. He stroked himself. His eyes, heavy, turned inwards, pressing inward. He turned over and tore her hands away from her crotch and shoved her arms up over her head. He kept his eyes closed. In his heart, he replayed the moment that his nose had been broken. His blood had spattered across the canvas, leaving him empty. His legs and shorts wet from his own urine. Blood and urine seemed to be everywhere, still seemed to be everywhere. Later, he circled the apartment warily as though it were in the corner. He went and touched the objects he had, caressing them or picking them up as though they might be clues. Some question he had yet to form. Dried petals in a bowl reminded him of slow skin. In the bathroom, he found Valium and cough medicine with codeine. He drank the cough medicine and took a Valium then put the vial in his pocket. In the bedroom, the boy turned his muscle back to the sleeping gray-white woman nestled. She reminded him of aging butter, not the words. He didn't think of words, just images slipping down the long hallways of his consciousness. He thought like a sly projector. He faced the window. His own reflection was superimposed over the reflection of the room, over the darkened buildings across the street. The window was a sound coming at him. He thought he could slip his fingers through the glass as if he were liquid. The doorbell rang. He sat upright. The boy rose since the woman didn't wake up. The doorbell rang again, but she didn't flinch. He shrugged and rose to answer the door. The woman, was it a woman, stood well over six feet tall and wore her bleached blonde hair piled on top of her head. Her lips were violent and red as her cheeks. Her eyes were round and black and piercing. She was wearing a long black cape that reached to the floor. She smiled suddenly, revealing gold-capped teeth and a large, wet tongue. She looked like a transvestite from the wrong side of the highway. He didn't notice the dwarf who was somewhere in her cape until he popped his head out from between her legs. He was chunky and balding and ugly. The features in his face pressed too closely together and flat like a clay model quickly sculpted and unfinished. A lit cigarette dangled dangerously from between his thin lips. When he stepped out from the cape and stood between himself and the woman, the boy saw that his brown trousers were unzipped and that his shirt was untucked and unbuttoned, revealing a frighteningly hairy chest. Hello, said the woman, pulling his gaze from the dangerous little man in front of him. She had a deep voice that seemed somehow to echo. The dwarf stepped suddenly forward and hit the boy hard just above the pelvis and started dancing around absurdly on his toes and jabbing. The boy was doubled over, gasping fish-like for air. His eyes were popped wide when the dwarf hit him again, this time on the bridge of his nose. He heard the crack of the cartilage. The last thing he thought before he blacked out was that he'd wet his shorts again. Thank you. That was Seth King, Mr. DeLay on, music, on music instrument. Remember, everybody, this is a poetry reading. It's a special thing. It's a, Babs is making whispering sounds. 
And so if you want to cruise and get loaded and grab, play gra grab, uh, grab ASS, uh, go upstairs now, because this, this is a very private special affair. <clears throat> special affair. Our next performer is a good friend of mine. He's, uh, I, uh, he's uh, author of, <clears throat> well, he's this guy. He's author of I'm a Rancher and a Raver. He'll be slamming Friday night at the New Yorican, and lovingly I call him the Prince of Regal Park. Please welcome very fine artist, David Huberman. Okay. Who said, I, did, wasn't there a poet that said something about wet panties? I want those wet panties right now. In my face. In my face. Yeah. I'll be snorting on those panties. Here we go. Okay, this is about my dream. I had one of those erotic wet dreams that males always have every once in a while. It was horrible. It was miserable. But you know what? I was wet. It was like the sea. I thought I was drowning in it. This is called life sentence. It began with the dream. There I was, strung up naked like a side of beef on some weird bondage contraption. There were huge mirrors on every wall, even on the ceiling. It made me think I was deep in the confines of some exclusive Beverly Hills bordello. I racked my brain to remember where I was and how I got there. Nothing came to mind. Everything was still, still except for my own heavy, perverted breathing. Not only was I tightly bound, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move a muscle. It was like somebody slipped me a nerve drug. Oh then someone walked into the room. She was tall. She was black. She was proud. Oh she was all 100% woman, totally bald. She had a majestic walk. She reminded me of a big stalking cat, a man-eating tiger. I was in trouble. She was dressed in a skimpy black leather outfit, beautiful yet grotesque. She held a huge riding crop in her hand. She snapped the whip twice and pointed it to me. Suddenly, suddenly I recognized her. She was the model on, on some of those Ohio Play album covers. One of their hit songs, Funky Worms, started playing in my head. And then she started speaking to me. Her voice was deep and crisp. The music within me died down. Her voice feels so powerful. It gives me goosebumps and, I, and my hair prickles up and stands up in fear. Fear. Yes, fear. I had fear shooting. And she said, she said, you have been found guilty by the... She said, you have been found guilty by the highest court ever of crimes of the imagination. You have tampered with the unbroken natural laws, but it is quite the other way. The laws were made to break undesirables like you. That is the way of the world. I hereby sentence you not to death, not to death, but to life. A life sentence of frustration of not getting what you need or want for the rest of your pathetic life. And then, and then, and then she sneers at me and snaps the whip twice and proceeds to whip me, all the while continually laughing at me. Her laughter cut through me like little knives and needles. Torture, baby, torture, we love it. And then I woke up in a cold sweat and I could still hear her laughing even now. Life sentence! I got a life sentence! Honk, honk. Okay, one more, and I'm out of here. Honk. Now, this is, everybody knows, no, I, I, I know, especially different. the male population in this room. Father Schmidt. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to WFMU, Uppsala College, East Orange, New Jersey, where we're broadcasting the Neil Cassidy Memorial Broadcast live from Fez. Fez is a nightclub on... Lafayette and Great Jones Street in Manhattan. We're broadcasting for another 90 minutes. Coming up soon, all sorts of incredible folks. Eileen, Eileen who, who do we have coming up in the program? Um, let's see. We have Edwin Torres, Bob Holman, Pedro Pietri, Tom Burnett's coming up, um, Eleanor Nahn, Penny Arcade, Ron Cole, Glenn O'Brien, and Robert Aaron. 
Oh, oodles yeah. and oodles of folk. A frightening experience. We're trying to broadcast live from a, uh, a restaurant, well, a small cabaret that is commonly referred to as Fez. I'm here with Kim Spurlock, who together we've sort of put together this evening's program in a manner most peculiar. Evening, Kim. Good evening, Nick. We've got uh, a kind of an overworked guy on stage at the moment. That's okay. You know, that's life. The, 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 the general theme of things is over... Be anxious. Over... Uh, it's just a, 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 it's a, it's a, it's not very often that live performers actually have an opportunity to broadcast on the radio. Well, he, he's people, a, he's slamming. People come out in force. I hope no one is offended by my abusing of his personal space. But this is a, a program that I've been hosting for five years now, as of this week, and it is uh, one minute to nine o'clock here on WFMU Uppsala College, East Orange, New Jersey. We're broadcasting the Neil Cassidy Memorial broadcast live from Fez. Tonight's uh, special guests include Kim Spurlock, who is an oral historian and has collected oodles and oodles of stuff with regard to Neil Cassidy. Hey, we have brought Ken Babs out from his home in central mid-Oregon in the beautiful Willamette Valley, where I also uh, am from. And... Um, Majestic town of Dexter. The majestic town of Dexter. Look him up. Although his wife Eileen, who's sitting right here, will probably wouldn't appreciate it quite as much. Ken, I understand you spoke to. Um, I understand you spoke with uh, Father Harley Schmidt. Who is Harley Schmidt? Well, Father Harley Schmidt is Neil's godfather. That was David Hoverman. He baptized Neil at Camp Santa Maria when, when Neil was 12, which would have been 1938. He must be ancient. He's 78 years old. He's in great shape. Mind sharp as a tech. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he said a special mass for Neil on the 4th, which is the day that Neil died, which was, uh, what, Friday? Friday? This last Friday. Just the fourth day of... Uh, or was it Thursday? Or one of those days. It was the fourth day of February. Tomorrow, in fact, uh, coming up in just a few short hours, um, he's, it's already his birthday in London, but in a few short hours it will be Neil Cassidy's birthday. We won't be broadcasting any longer, but we'll actually be probably viewing slides here at Fez, uh, a selection of slides from Mary Prankster Day's uh, presumably that Ken Babs has brought along That's with right, us. That's right, on the bus. Our next performer is an author of Changing Tires. Who's our next performer? He's a futurist as well he is. Please welcome Edwin Torres. Edwin Torres is our oh, next now. guest. Hi, it's nice to be here. It's actually an honor. The spirit wishes to wake the sun. The spirit lies on its back. The spirit rolls on its side, the one that hurts. The sun wishes to wake the spirit. The spirit is gone. The sun finds another spirit. This is called Dirty Brown Birdie. Reflections on a warped door. Three holes, no vacancy, don't push, don't push, don't make me push. The light rams up the door, dead right between cheeks, between crevice of an open sore. I read you like an open here, but the key goes there. Tin, steel, polished, warp, brush the wine, oh then he'll talk. Don't shy away, your knob feels good, money. Suspenders, hold up your manhood, honey. Give me that, boy. Forced to look at your opening. Why is it in the middle? Is a lock of security. Guard it with your. Come on in, have a fresh coffee, stale cup. Cloudy morning, barely up. Hello, Isaida. Oye, cafe. Your waiter's name is Papo Popo Polska Jose. Got a snout chain. Oh, fat du jour. Children, matzo, oh, de door. Probiscus link. Cultural eavesdroppings dripping into my banana cakes. Sweetness on the back, monkey cakes. Woo, woo, woo. Her vision of life is a tease perm. 
Silver sperm on pearl picket fences lying with the tees. A cry inside where lonely hides from quiet concrete breezes. Concrete sidewalks break and crack, but lonely cries live on forever. Hear the breeze. Oi Moyam sees mommy son movies and conversates under hair dried, blown brain flowers. The bouquet of anarchy, a okay by me. Hey, Paisley Daggy Woodhead. Hey, dreadlock senile snout smoking, lice picking old babe. How you doing? Tulip provoked libido, paying 30 for a cheap breast joke. Door, don't move. Reflection, don't move. Clouds, don't move. People can't stand still. Locobia Picasso's graffito, organic beauty on years of there, always be there, always will. UF Shore Matisse, my man Manet would have dug the passionate orgasm of these kids. Your home, your money, Minerva's fresh. Obscure teenage love triangle, isosceles puberty equilateral period. Living the liquid inside her for the first time, Minerva gets stale as she grows older. She'll see, she'll love, she'll breathe. Wounded door hides from the world, I don't blame it. Dr. Trumpet's horn blows. Park bench prophet, be bobbing down to check out the cops. Pick back Patty Shacks down. Hey mister, give me a quarter, I'll give you forever. Big box, little change, help a big man make a little change. Big box, little change, help a big man make a little change. Pace, pace, keep pace. Finger stump, writes on a steamed window. Stupid boy, can't afford a sketch pad, give me that boy. You'll live, you'll love, you'll see. You'll live, you'll love, you'll see. Dirty brown birdie flies straight up from the ground. Big red white crust in his tiny beak, bigger than him even. Stands out for miles, happens right in front of me. He cuts through the gray clouds like a beacon of hope. Hope, hope you can feed your family. Dirty brown birdie. Dirty old man stands straight up in front of me, smiles through guitar picked teeth, white death in his mouth. I give him a quarter, he tells me his life story. His son was an inspiration that come to out came Sonny Boy. So I scooped him up and I bring him over to his mother. So I scooped him up and I bring him over to his mother. There she was, a stir in the spaghetti. So I raise her apron, Lord of Joys, and up went Sonny Boy. We're still waiting. Got a room for him and everything. Rivulets of minuets were dancing on his brow. He was crying and I wanted it to rain so I wouldn't see his tears. Don't want to see the old man's life dripping out of his eyes. Every tear that streamed down his face was laced with a simple life. A life I sometimes wish I had. Life's rain was staining his strong German face and I didn't need to see it. But rivulets of minuets came dancing from the Frau. Wounded door hides from the world, still there, never moves. Bricks never move, gray sky never moves, always there, always will be. People can't stop moving. Don't want to hear songs of love and life from a has and broken heart that cries twinkling lights. Listen, see the sunshine in the dark. This key don't fit this lock, this door won't open. These things don't work all the time. Step over the broken guardian angel that lies sleeping in the doorway. Put a quarter in his halo and come in and stop moving for a while. It's dark, it's good, it's pouring. Okay. That was Edwin Torres and uh, our next performer is a poet from, um, from a far-off country uh, where um, a lot of word jazz uh, objects are from, like Volvos and Ludafisk and things like that. That's Norway. Please, please welcome uh, from Stockholm um, a visual artist and poet, Carl Holmquist. I uh, have a lo love poem, and I'm... Uh, I know you're not supposed to write about this kind of stuff, so I'd like to apologize for that. No, there's a lot of room for love. 
Okay, and uh, on top of it, it's called "Is there in anybody in there?" Which is a kind of stupid question this evening. But anyway. <clears throat> Is there anybody in there? I've been trying to call, been trying to knock with my boxing gloves still on and my shiny shorts. And I was kind of thinking there would be something in them someone would want to take a closer look at. Uh, in live radio, we have to occasionally do things which are necessary in a live situation where poets, poets make words which then become radio. That's right, and radio wouldn't be alive without these things we have to do. We're here with Ken Babs and Kim Spurlock. Kim, you got this tape from Father Schmidt that I want to hear. Oh, you, you, you do want to hear it. I want to hear it at some point, but I also want to talk about the general nature of... Uh, radio words and the exact quotation on the stock market this morning well we'll be getting to that uh, presently but first and we, and as Nick was saying that's right peace on earth and goodwill towards men uh, what I remember doing, that what we're doing is celebrating yes. many things we're celebrating the fifth anniversary of this radio program well, that, that's we're that's selling the uh, we're, we're selling the Brooklyn Bridge <laughs> and we're celebrating the general uh, happiness brought on by the death 25 years ago of Neil Cassidy. That's right. This is a super good wake, wouldn't you say, Kim? Absolutely. Degradation leads to joy in some instances. Yes, Neil, it does. And, uh, Neil died. In Neil kind of abides somehow, you know, and uh, we're kind of honoring his bones tonight, you know. In the, he came across the border, you know, uh, his uh, uh, thing on the, uh, uh, the soul of wetback migrant worker. Uh, that you, uh, he was carried this virus, it's the Cassidy virus, and it was spread through right. America after his death down there. Yes, that's right. I believe it's uh, uh, Father William Burroughs who speaks of the uh, language virus. He sure does. And Cassidy. Word yeah. is virus. virus. Yes. What exactly? Well, this and thing. virus like, is language. We'll hear it too with this thing of it's a letter to Neil Cassidy, from Neil Cassidy to his uh, priest. No, what we got here tonight is. Uh, you know, Father Schmidt is still alive. He's 78 years old. He's a Monsignor in uh, Denver. And he said Mass for Neil on his on the 4th. That's terrific. And this is the man that Neil wrote to when he was in he, the prison. That's right. Uh, that's right. It's a book that's uh, being published in April called Grace Beats Karma, The Prison Letters of Neil Cassidy, coming out Blast Books. And I've read it, and it's super good. Uh, uh, the best thing uh, that fills in the years, 58 through 60, of Neil Cassidy, for you aficionados out there. So for... Uh, the so next three minutes, we're going to try to see if the roof can be raised up another three feet. Uh, the uh, ambient air right at this level has uh, started to solidify. So we want to get it up just a little bit more. So would you mind pumping that thing over there for a minute, Kim? I'm going to uh, key up this thing, right? Okay, there it goes. Bam, see? So. Hello, Kim Spurlock. This is Father Schmidt calling from Denver, Colorado. I uh, didn't know who else to call except but today I believe is the 24th anniversary, or the 25th anniversary of uh, Neil Cassidy's death. And so I said a mass for him. Just wanted you to know. I don't know if you want to tell his wife Carolyn about it or not. I believe he died on February the 4th, 1968, which would be 25 years ago today. Hard to believe. I just thought I'd share that with you. Bye bye. reason why he has to die of exposure. Um, that was Father Schmidt. Um, I would like to uh, take a musical who baptized Neil Cassidy. Uh, That's right. You know what I called him back? I called him back and I asked him uh, if he would talk to me a little bit about how, how you can pray for somebody when you're dead. And he explained it to me. You want to hear that part? I would. That's a good part. But, uh, you know, I think the... the um, let's let this band... The band is Huge Voodoo and they're about to do something on their own. Briefly. Good. I'd like to send a shout out to uh, we'll my mix, homeboy we'll Clayton. Father Bruce in a little bit. If you're listening tonight, Father this Schmidt, one's for please. you. Cassie's got about That's right. uh, you know, saying maps for Neil. Yeah. Uh, could you? At the Little Sisters of the Poor. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, 
And uh, I announced to the, to the old people and to the sisters, uh, the Bobby mass, Seale, and they we got a brother with a friend. You're listening to the dulcet tones of Huge Voodoo, broadcasting live from Fez. Huge Voodoo has been accompanying the recent poets occasionally, and uh, will accompany a couple more here before the evening subsides. Huge Voodoo. Huge Voodoo. Huge Voodoo. Which is important too. The two pieces of poetry I really dug always grabbed my attention that had something to do with causing the Black Panther Party was the one called Nigger Town. And this may give you an insight to how at least some of us would think some of the type of poetry we choose. You remember me seeing a movie called Mississippi Burning? It didn't reflect very much. It did reflect somewhat on the children who were bombed in the church in 1964. Black folks wrote poems about that. One is called Nigger Town. It goes like this. In Nigger Town, in Nigger Town, the streets is made of mud. Infested with rat, bat, and bug. Nigger Town, in Nigger Town, the streets is made of brick. Huh. Oh, ask any living swing of brick to have a pet. In Nigger Town, in Nigger Town, three little children kneel to pray. In Jesus' name. What? little poem that makes you feel, that made us think. It was printed in Liberator Magazine, other places, other periodicals. Yeah, so it, you know, I got your message this morning. Ooh, that, that got to us this way. Yeah. At the Little Sisters of the Poor, mm -hmm. here in the modern home for the elderly, I am chaplain. And uh, I announced to the, to the old people and to the sisters uh, the mass, and they joined in with the prayers. Mm -hmm. I told them that he was my godson and, mm -hmm. and died uh, tragically 25 years ago today. Hmm. How does that? How does it work exactly? I mean, um, where, where is Neil's soul right now? Is it? Do you have? A, do you have an idea? Where is his soul? Yeah. That we do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that uh, that's the purpose. Uh, we hope he's in heaven. Mm -hmm. But uh, is uh, uh, do you know about purgatory? Uh, Just a little bit. Purgatory is uh, where the souls go that uh, are not bad enough to go to hell, mm -hmm. and yet not good enough yet to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And where we can help them by our prayers and by especially by holy masses, mm -hmm. uh, and, and saying these, uh, and helping them out. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I do not know. I. Mm -hmm. uh, as to what condition he was in, what spiritual condition he was in. Some souls uh, do go straight to heaven upon their death. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, they have to linger in purgatory a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think in my own case, I'll be lucky if I get to purgatory. <laughs> Like half half liars are worse than real full liars, because at least the person who lies all the time, you know they're a liar. But a half liar's got your trust, so then in a way they're worse. So half sitters, you know, you know, sit or get off the spot. Whoops. All right. Our next performer is a performance poet recently featured in the Chicago Tribune as as Arnold Stang on Speed. Please welcome my friend and uh, colleague Tom Burnett. Ears to hear, eyes to see. 
heart. One thought, one word, one sound heard sets off a tangent of operatic proportions. Tangent alert, tangent alert, louder music please, louder music please, tangent alert, tangent alert. The deceptions are piling high, one on top of another. The deceptions are piling high. The first bullet blast, the first bullet blast, the first bullet blast of the 30-year rape. The picket fence at Dealey Plaza, the picket fence, dozens run to it. Shooting from the picket fence, dozens run to it. The carefully painted scenery facade can come crashing down. The picket fence, dozens run to it. The picket fence, run to it, run to it. Unaccountable bullet blasts, impossible, implausible trajectories, magic scenarios, modern medical terminologies deciphered like ancient hieroglyphics. Interpretations explode in all directions. Head snaps in the obvious reflex motion. As one deer hunter put it, as many deer as I've shot, I've never known one to fall toward me. The picket fence, the picket fence, dozens run to it, dozens run to it. Hobos and boxcars, clean shaven and polished shoes, familiar resemblances, a day of pigs. The picket fence, run to it, a stolen body, a missing brain, two caskets, white sheets to black zipper body bags. The picket fence, harassed witnesses, witnesses harassed, witnesses disappear in cars, by cancer off boats, they disappear. Interpretations explode in all directions, dozens run to it. The picket fence, the picket fence, anonymous cause, whispered rumors, intimidations cowed into silence, freakish accidents, aura of fear, witnesses disappear, interpretations explode in all directions. The rapes are piling high, one on top of another, the rapes are piling high. The first bullet blast of the 30-year rape, from Johnny to Bobby to Martin to Malcolm to Ronnie, Vietnam to George, Iran to water contra gates, bungled break-ins, bucks for barms, arm the poor, covert war, toxic emissions, trilateral commissions, a can of worms, a tip of the bird, cold war cover-ups, blankets over eyes. We're at a turning point. Can we get the point? We're at a turning point. Are we at a turning point? The wall has fallen, the door has opened, and only a crack. The carefully painted scenery facade can come crashing down like a New Year's resolution throughout the old storm in the new with a surging upheaval in the street in your face kind of race. The rumble's getting closer. There are messages in the air, ears to hear, eyes to see. Messages in the air, ears to hear, eyes to see. Frame 313, frame 313, frame 313. Cantion alert. It takes 13 pennies stacked on top of each other to be as tall as one standing on its edge. Columbus actually landed on October the 13th. 13 states in the Union, 13 witches in a coven, 13 steps in a gallows, 13 knots in a hangman's noose, 13 at the Last Supper, death the Egyptians, 13th stage of earthly life, transition to the eternal. Tangent alert, tangent alert. The picket fence, run to it, run to it. feel like I want to live damn it all a billion that. years ago. See, I wrote Patience 400 times and it's a damn it all. <laughs> this is for Neil Cassidy. I'm dropping the harmonica. Uh, for Neil Cassidy. Billy Burroughs Jr., 1979. Old cowboy. Older buddy. On the bridge crossing the Denver track. You knocked me down so hard off the sidewalk onto the pavement. Cleverly clipping me behind the knees twice. And a second time, I knew it had to be you looking over the boxcars. I was thinking about you. And after the second crack, I realized I was clumsy. And I threw those hand tool boots to the rail. Remember? And you weren't even alive. Neil, I know what they said to you. They said, we are thinking people, Neil. We are intellectual. We cannot feel, so feel for us, Neil. Feel for us now. Be Neil for us, Neil. Be Neil for us now. Make it good, Neil. Make it God for us, Neil. Neil, make us feel. It's no wonder. Say his name.
Neil Cassidy, Neil Cassidy, say his name. Who was he? Who was he? Why do we celebrate him? Why do we celebrate him? way to hold both and I said, yes, that was my first contact with reality for about 27 years. got a flat or a suspension change even. We you know what happened back there? That's right. Well, right through that stop sign. Well, I didn't go too fast. I went too first. What I did. And an image flashed in front of my face and said, wake up, wake up. Pay attention, pay attention. I said, okay, I'm ready, man, give it to me. My eyes were wide open and the snow was coming down. The snowflakes were big enough to make me go blind for 22 seconds. And Neil said, remember, son, it don't matter which way you go around the curve this way or go around the curve that way. You got to go on the other side of that, really. Let me tell you the truth. Blast the smashes. Be gorgeous and be gash. Is there, a, is there a Bob Holman in the house? Rebar, Babs, rebar. Rebar, Babs, Ladies rebar. and gentlemen in Radio Land and Fez, I would like to introduce to you, without further ado, a one Mr. Bob Holman. Of Bob New Yorkian ca Poets Cafe. Right. You know, it said that uh, Neil Cassidy would always participate in three conversations at once. This is a complete transcription of one of his threesome conversations, a poem for Neil Cassidy called simply Neil Cassidy. Thinking he is hanging from his fingertips over the great abyss, is in fact slipping slowly into the smokestack of a giant steam locomotive. I know fear. What am I doing here? 
just a glance in a chance dance of the mirrored rearward fresh burnt freak free to see jaybirds running naked out of the burbs shouting how's life so blurb for itself verb don't see man's a cat catapult to nine tails flailing sails on the rat related nation eviscerated nickel and a dime preview preview meet my dad's shiny cheese my ma's era bars my grandparents migrated here from venus malamars my brothers and my sisters are alive inside my blisters and i keep track of the stars yes that's my job to keep track of the dovetails the exhausted pipes and the stars. I don't eat meat. Go get that. I don't swallow greens. Go All I eat it. is air and hair and Have beans. Keep myself rolling steam in a dream roller. Steam roller rolling a dream. Flatten Wilco, the echo. No, no. No, no, no. Oh, there's a good season, too, good reason to believe it. Look to your left to see right through. This skin of mine sure wants skin off of you. Did the impolite political imp slip the spine slide? Fracture jaw, gee jaw, donkey can of hide. See it, breathe it, leave it, sneeze it, freeze it. 60 miles a second to the blade in L.A. Juice caboose, laying life tracks for home. Come, livey, 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 that's a springtime's bone. Wake me. Wake me when I'm Wake dead. Me. Wake me. me when I'm dead. Ladies and gentlemen. Don't you do that. Ladies and gentlemen. Don't you do that. Bob Holman. Okay, we're cutting anyone who goes over one poem, I guess. Friendly fascism for you? I guess so, you know, radio is a tight, tight medium. And that's the life that goes. Bob Holman is a wonderful human being and a fine, fine person who helped put this evening together in a way. We're broadcasting live from WFMU, Uppsala College, East Orange, New Jersey. This is broadcasting from Fez over the airwaves of WFMU. No second thoughts, thanks. The first one's overdone. Now wait a second, second, and the other one's begun. Hey! It's just your mind starting to overdrive. The exhausted pipes on the third rail. Slugging through the swampy, swampy night. Frozen on a cruise and losing sight for a dollar bill pill. I guess I can't worry about it. Get up with a framework, the picture frame up still. I gotta get and I'm just having a nice day, thank you. Suicide in the line. The whole picture frame up slaps up fine on fine. With the blurred word inferred on the high time tide. Instant reincarnation, tongue to ear resuscitation, the rattling, battling of the mouth and the ear. I say, come near, come near, come near, come here, come here, come hear my fear. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Holman, curator of the New Yorican Poets Cafe. Thank you, Ken. Up now, a one Mr. Pedro Pietre. <laughs> okay. Oh, That's Matthew. Pedro Pietre. Uh, that was Bob Holman. He's the MC of New York Regan's Poet Slam and the author of 1990. Lo lovely year a couple years ago. Next performer, his new, his new book is entitled Reflection in a Revolving Door, which contains seven early plays, including The Masses, the Masses Are Asses, published by University of Puerto Rico Press. Pedro Pietre. Accompanied by Huge Voodoo. This, this poem is uh, entitled Reheating the Cold War. Reheating the Cold War. And I'm uh, dedicated to my brother, Dr. Willie, who, like Neil Cassidy, is also a freelance gynecologist. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but anyway, it goes like this. 
Everything is justified Unless you deny that you lie Everything is justified or joking aside Unless you deny that you lie Everything is justified, no lie, no lie or joking aside Unless you deny that you lie Everything is justified, no jive, no jive, no lie, no lie or joking aside Unless you deny that you lie Ten thousand spies out of a job Oh my God, oh my God What will they do? What will they do? Who will they kill? Who will they kidnap? Who will they frame in the name of the game that drives you insane? Everything is justified, don't hide, don't hide, no jive, no jive, no lie, no lie, or joking aside, unless you deny that you lie. Whose phone will they tap? Whose wife will they swap? Lord Almighty, why so many unemployed spies? What is the problem? What was the problem? They were always the problem, and now they have a problem. Everything is justified, don't cry, don't cry, don't hide, don't hide, no jive, no jive, no lie, no lie, or joking aside. Aside, unless you deny that you lie 10,000 spies out of a job Oh my God, oh, oh my, my God, God. Oh my Where God. will they work? Where will they work? The I poor goddamn blind. jerks Who will need them? Who will want them? No Send one. them to the post The Others. post office that is Spies make good mailmen They will deliver the mail after they read it <laughs> Everything is justified I, 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 I Don't cry, don't cry, don't hide, don't hide No jive, no jive, no lie, no lie Or joking aside Unless you deny that you lie Say what? Say how? Say how come? Say how come they read what is none of their business But that is unconstitutional Spies are above the constitution That's why they belong in mental institutions Spies have split personalities they are revolutionaries and reactionaries too They can work anywhere, there is no work to do And now that there is really nothing for all those spies to do Who will want them? What will they do? Who will they screw? What will they do? Who will they screw? What will they do? Who will Wives. they screw? Why? Everything is Wives. justified, stay high, stay high I, 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 don't cry, don't cry, don't hide, don't hide No jive, no jive, no lie, no lie Or joking aside, unless you deny that you lie Oh my God, oh my God, 10,000 spies out of a job Who will want them? Who will want them? Uncle Sam wants them, that's who will want them Uncle Sam will find something for spies to do, regardless of race Color or creed, Uncle Sam always despised, especially unemployed spies. They can be used to overthrow democracy in Russia and bring back the KGB so that we in the land of the free and the freeze can have a dangerous enemy once again. Because without an enemy, America cannot be America. America cannot be courageous. America cannot be America. America needs some deadly weapons. America has to kill. It's just a fight. Don't ask why, don't ask why. Stay high, stay high. Don't ask why, don't ask why. Stay high, stay high. I, 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 I. Don't cry, don't cry, don't hide, don't hide. No jive, no jive. No joking aside, unless you deny that you lie. On second thought, if 10,000 spies became mailmen, 10,000 postal workers will be out of a job. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But Uncle Sam doesn't give a damn. If he wants the spies to become mailmen, the mailmen the spies will be, regardless of who has seniority among the stamp lickers of democracy. Because this is Sam's land, not your land or my land. And Sam wants many enemies, and Sam needs many enemies. So please, please, please become a threat to national security today. Give a spy a break. Hate the United States now. Everything is justified. Don't ask why, don't ask why. Stay high, stay high. I, 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 I. Don't cry, don't cry. Don't hide, don't hide. No jive, no jive. We're joking aside. Unless you deny that you lie. No! That was Pedro Pietri. Manhattan Zone. Our next performer is applying for Renaissance man status. He's a poet and painter. He's having a show opening in March, and he's read a Jackie 60 of late. Please welcome Matthew Benedict. Thank you, Matthew. Very pleased to be included here. I have two poems. Uh, the first one is a sex poem. It's called Sexy Milk. Music, guys. 
Bring me that sweet, raw, uncut milk, doll. I said I wanted to drink from the carton. Breathe in that milk carton stench. You, sad in your seersucker, so sad in your seersucker. Where is our milkman with our milk? Where is our oil man with our oil? No man here to read my meter. Nobody on my doorstep to spoil. Come with your ill-cut, ill-fitting suit. You of the threadbare dime store boxer brief and set your cheap briefcase down beside me. Come with your midtown middleman voice. Smear and bind me with typewriter ribbon. Bring me the residue of your office. Bring me that sweet, raw, uncut milk, doll. You said you'd drink from the carton. The second poem is called Gotham. It's about New York, and, it, and uh, it's for Alejandro Correa. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. Hungry, tired, and queer for liars, flesh, and the press. I wrung out my hair in the corner of the night train, fumbled with my slicker. I needed something, sometimes, which can only be purchased at the crossroads of the world. Towers of blackened blocks of cut brimstone, steamy, smoky, lonely town, where desperation and a false calm reign. There are dregs about and sluts. Dawn, the city rises and heaves, a time of its own, a place to hide. Corpse of an angel found floating in the river, a hate of its own, a place to mourn. Steamy, smoky, murder town, spewing up stars and monsters, scattering be-penciled and bespectacled lady critics down its canyons, a magnet for desperation, debris, and inversion, the big picture, the stony end, the naked city, Gotham. I, too, will be injected into your bloodstream, scotch rocks, cup of joe, please, regular, sidecar, straight up. And I too will leave my wrecks upon you, O oh stone slab, fish-shaped, O oh wall-eyed island. That was Matthew Benedict of Greenpoint. All right, we'll have some more music by Angel-Headed Hipster, I do believe. How about, shall we bring up old Alan to go with him? I mean, Gregory? Matthew. Yeah. Matthew. Yes. <laughs> Courtney. Yeah, Nick. Whew! What an evening. It's true. Don't anybody tell you different. It's very true. Yeah, this is epic. Let's hear it for huge voodoo. Yeah. Poet extraordinaire accompanionists. Let's hear it for the angel-headed hipsters. Yell, yell. Let's hear it for Matthew Courtney, who has been hosting this past period of time. And thank you for everybody who came to, uh, for coming tonight. You all know who you are. Yeah. Is there a Penny Arcade in the house? Yeah, I got one. She's on her way. She's transit. Spurlock's daughter's name is going to go with us. Gung Ho. John Hall. John Hall. Who's he? Who he? Hey, Ken, I see that you and Peter are up on the stage. But also is Spurlock's daughter. And have you got something brief for us? Yes. I hope so. 